Welcome everyone. This is lecture 23 of our series of lectures on disorders of fluid and electrolytes. These lectures accompany and explain my book manual of fluid, electrolyte, and acid-base disorders, a pathophysiologic approach to common clinical problems. I'm Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I'm a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. This is the book. You can find it as an ebook or as a paperback on Amazon. I'll provide the link in the description below. We are still on chapter 2, hypokalemia. This is the last lecture in this chapter. We are still doing case studies in hypokalemia. Case number 8, complicated hypokalemia. Here we have a 72-year-old man who was admitted to the intensive care unit due to osteomyelitis. He was started on nafcillin 2 grams every 4 hours intravenously. He has other problems, severe COPD for which he was started on BiPAP. The patient also is receiving intensive nebulizer regimen with albuterol. He has stage 4 chronic kidney disease. He's on enteral feeding via NG tube. He's getting a renal formula, Nepro, at 55 ml an hour. The patient has been having increased lower extremity edema and was placed on furosemide 80 mg IV Q12 hours due to hypernatremia, sodium-146. He was started on D5W at 70 ml per hour. Over three days, his potassium dropped from 4 to 2.4. What is the etiology of his hypokalemia? Let's unpack all this. So this is a complicated patient, and in complicated patients, hypokalemia is multifactorial. Notice, number one, he's on a renal formula. He's on Nepro. This is low in potassium. Number two, he's on D5W. This doesn't have any potassium. Moreover, the dextrose will stimulate insulin secretion. This will drive potassium into the cells. Number three, albuterol in his nebulizer therapy will shift potassium intracellularly also. Number four, nafcillin, like we said, is a non-absorbable anion. So this will stimulate potassium excretion in the collecting duct. Finally, furosemide is a big factor in causing hypokalemia, in causing a renal loss of potassium. So here we have not one reason, but five reasons for his hypokalemia. Case number nine, here we have a recalcitrant hypokalemia, a resistant hypokalemia. A 50-year-old woman was referred to the renal clinic for persistent hypokalemia. She's on extended release, potassium chloride, 20 mole equivalents twice daily. She is complaining of arms and legs cramping. She has fatigue, urinary frequency, and nocturia. Blood pressure is 105 over 54. Labs. Sodium-135, potassium 2.7, so it's really low. Bicarb, high, 29. Magnesium is very low, 1. Calcium, 9. 24-hour urine collection shows high sodium, 130, high chloride, 140, high potassium, 45, all mill equivalents per 24 hours. Note that urine calcium is low, only 30 milligrams per 24 hours. So what's going on here? Is it just a case of hypokalemia due to hypomagnesemia? So we just replace magnesium and potassium and then we're done? Well, you could say that, and you have to do that, actually, but this doesn't explain why the patient has hypokalemia. Let's try to discuss this a little bit more. Why is this patient hypokalemic? So first of all, we have high urine potassium, so we have renal loss of potassium. Serum bicarb is high. This is consistent with metabolic alkalosis. The patient also has severe hypomagnesemia. Urine studies show high sodium, high chloride, but low urine calcium. Now, is this due to vomiting? Is she inducing vomiting? Is she bulimic? No. Here we have high urine potassium. With vomiting, we would have a low urine potassium. Moreover, like I said many times, with vomiting, we have a low urinary chloride. Here we have high urine chloride. So it is not vomiting. Is it diarrhea or laxative abuse or use? This is a very common cause of potassium. Now, again, no. With diarrhea, 
you don't have renal loss with potassium. The kidneys would preserve potassium. Also with diarrhea, you have metabolic acidosis, non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. Here, you have alkalosis, metabolic alkalosis. So it is not diarrhea either. So what, what is it? Is it diuretic abuse? Well, yeah, it could be. It fits. You have renal loss of potassium, yeah, diuretic, check. Hypomagnesemia, yes. Metabolic alkalosis, you would see that with diuretics. Low urine calcium, yes. High urine sodium and chloride. All these things can be seen when someone is using or abusing a thiazide diuretic, including the low urine calcium. Actually, we use thiazide diuretics in patients with hypercalciuria, forming stones, of course, to reduce urinary calcium. So the treatment is with a thiazide diuretic. So the patient here denied using any diuretics. Um, urine screen for diuretics was negative. And the diagnosis actually is consistent with Gittelman syndrome. And it was confirmed with genetic testing, the only way to confirm such a diagnosis. So let's talk about this syndrome. Gittelman syndrome is an autosomal or recessive disorder. It is a salt-wasting nephropathy. So salt-wasting meaning the patient is going to waste sodium and chloride. So blood pressure is going to be normal or low normal or even low. So you're not going to have hypertension. It is usually to mutation in the SLC12A3 gene. You don't have to memorize that. This results in dysfunction in the thiazide-sensitive sodium chloride cotransporter, or NCC channel, in the distal tubule. This is the channel, or this is the transporter, on which thiazide diuretics work. The late onset and low urinary calcium are characteristic of Gittelman. They are distinguishing factors of Gittelman, of course, from Barter syndrome. However, the only way to make the distinction is via genetic testing. Let's compare these two syndromes because this is very common on a test. If you are taking a nephrology type board uh, test, you will see that. Barter syndrome, you have hypokalemia with metabolic alkalosis and normal or low blood pressure. Gittelman, same thing, hypokalemia with metabolic alkalosis and normal or low blood pressure. But with Barter syndrome, you have high urine calcium. With Gittelman, low urine calcium. So this is very, very important. With Barter syndrome, you have normal urinary magnesium. With Gittelman, it is high, and you have hypomagnesemia. Again, the manifestation of Barter are akin. They're similar to taking a loop diuretic. And this is why you have high urine calcium. While with Gittelman, it's like taking a thiazide diuretic, and this is why you have low urine calcium. Both are salt-wasting nephropathies, so blood pressure is low or low normal. Actually, in Gittelman syndrome, some patients have salt craving. Some have been re reported to drink like pickle juice because they have this, this much craving. So uh, Barter syndrome also is more common in uh, childhood in children, although there's an adult onset uh, Barter syndrome. There are maybe like five subtypes of uh, uh, Barter syndrome. Uh, some patients can have uh, mental uh, uh, deficiency. Now, treatment, of course, you're going to uh, replace the potassium. You are going to replace the magnesium. And... Um, you can use uh, uh, potassium-sparing diuretics, and uh, pro prostaglandins are elevated, so uh, some have used also non steroid anti-inflammatory medications to suppress prostaglandin uh, production. Uh, now, let's look at this. I just want to emphasize uh, with this diagram, on the left, we have the tau, the thick ascending limb, followed by the... Uh, distal collecting tubule, then the uh, collecting tubule, okay, uh, connecting tubule, and then the collecting tubule. So uh, notice that we have the sodium to chloride potassium exchanger in the tau, and then we have the sodium chloride cotransporter, or the NCC, in the distal, distal collecting tubule. So this is the normal condition. With Gittelman syndrome, like we said, 
we have a problem with what? With the NCC, with the sodium chloride co-transporter in the distal collecting tubule. It is like taking a thiazide diuretic. Now with Barter syndrome, the problem is with the sodium potassium two chloride exchanger. Okay, so it is like taking what? A loop diuretic. This is where loop diuretics work. So remember that and uh, you should be fine. You'll be able to deduce the features of both uh, if, if you uh, recall uh, the effect of diuretics in, in those areas. Last case, hypokalemia due, due to furosemide. Here we have 63-year-old man. He's on furosemide, 40 POVID for chronic systolic CHF. Potassium is 3.1. He was started on KCL 20 BID. Repeat potassium one week later was 3.8. A month later, it was 3.3. Why? Because he thought that uh, it's too much money to pay for extended release potassium chloride, and he started to buy over the counter potassium gluconate 99 milligram tablets. He was taking one tablet twice a day. So, how do we approach this? Well, potassium gluconate 99 milligram tablets contain only 2.5 milliequivalents of KCL. So rather than taking the prescribed 40 milliequivalents of KCL daily, he's been taking only five. So really, this patient is taking furosemide. He uh, may develop hypokalemia with metabolic alkalosis. So we have to replace with KCL, with potassium salt. Okay, with pota the, uh, the KCL is the preferred potassium salt. If cost is an issue, we can recommend a salt substitute. Like I said before, each gram contains 13.6 milliequivalents, so about a half a teaspoon, 3 grams, will give him 40 milliequivalents of KCL, so it is cheap. Another option, a very attractive and good option, is to use spironolactone, which would preserve not only potassium but also magnesium, and he has chronic systolic CHF, in, in advanced CHF, it's been proven to reduce mortality, so you may be able to cut down on the amount of potassium chloride needed or eliminate it all together. I'm going to end here. This is the end of hypokalemia. Next lecture is going to be on hyperkalemia. See you then.